Fairburn is one of the most acclaimed chroniclers of American Indian life. I recently had the pleasure to sit down with him and talk about his new book, The Girl Who Sang to the Buffalo. It's the conclusion to the trilogy that started with Neither Wolf Nor Dog and The Wolf at Twilight. I hope you'll enjoy the interview. One of the questions that has come up around The Girl Who Sang to the Buffalo is this. Is it a novel or is it nonfiction? Can you explain? The answer is yes. <laughs> it is a novel and it is nonfiction. Mm -hmm. The categories, I've struggled with this for years. Uh, the categories are literary categories, they don't fit exactly. The book, that book and the other books that preceded it, Neither Wolf Nor Dog and The Wolf of Twilight, are teaching stories. They utilize my whole background in oral history where I listen carefully, take notes, hear the words of the native people, and then put them in the mouths of people that I've known that I've sometimes very often expanded. In fact, now at this point I've expanded them into uh, fully blown creations. They're like people, they're like friends of mine, literary friends of mine now. And I walk them through and walk myself through native reality where I've spent a lot of time, the, natives, the native streets, the native towns, the native uh, culture, the native beliefs. So it's a way of telling about the native experience, teaching the native experience without turning it into fiction or without making it into a documentary journalism. It's walking through the fields of reality with real people and telling stories based on their actual words. Hmm. And it's, it, it's, hard, it, it's hard to explain this, and I, I've had a difficult time for years. People say, is it true? Uh, I say, well, are Van Gogh's paintings true? Are they factual, or isn't that a fair question? And this isn't to give myself the, the, the claim of being an, an artist of that quality, but it's real. It's a real issue when it comes to interpreting. You base it in reality, but you interpret it to draw the reader in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You write so beautifully in this new book, not just about the landscape, but also about the culture stolen from Native people through the whole array of institutions where Indians were locked away for so many years. How did you come across this story, and why did you think it was important to tell? The story you're referring to is the Canton Asylum. Mm -hmm. That there was a place in South Dakota called the Canton Asylum for Insane Indians. I came across it while I was researching the boarding schools, which were, in their own right, terrible experiences where kids were taken in, uh, away from their parents, uh, had their language and their hair and their culture shorn from them and raised without the care and love of parents. And it was a very brutal experience. In the course of this, I came across reference to an institution in this little town of Canton, South Dakota, called the Hiawatha Asylum for, Asylum for Insane Indians. I was traveling in that area. I went to see the place where it had been. It was now gone. But what's left is a grave site that, it's not a mass grave, they're all individual graves, but it's in a golf course now, and it's fenced in with an old, uh, not, not picket fence, what do you call them, like a split rail fence. Mm -hmm. But you can look, you can actually look on Google Earth, or Google Maps and see it. There were all the impressions of the graves, it was like it was corrugated land. And you knew the, go the ghosts of these people were present in that land. And the poignancy of their presence and how totally they'd been obliterated from history made me say, I want to tell this story. These are people who need to be, if not eulogized, at least remembered. We remember so many horrible things and so many good things that have happened both in and because of our American experience. Here are some forgotten people. And Forgotten people is almost the mantra that I have about what the Native experience has been. They've forgotten, been forgotten in our history, forgotten in our historical narrative, and this institution sort of embodied that, and I wanted to tell the story. 
As a non-native writer, how have you been able to successfully bridge the gap between native and non-native worlds? Wilma, Man Wilma mm, I can say this, Wilma Mankiller, uh, who was the head of the Cherokee tribe, said, white people have such a sense of entitlement. They think that they can ask anything, do anything, go anywhere. And I take that seriously. I assume that this is their land, I'm a guest on their land, and I've worked on the reservations. I did oral histories for several years, and I've I've just gotten to know and like the Native people. I never presume I have a right to go anywhere. My good intentions don't give me entree to anything. I wait at the door until I'm asked. And so I never attempt to enter into ceremonies, never attempt to, never ask to go anywhere. I let myself be seen. And that is really the key because uh, they, in a very, very deep level, the Native people learned everything about how they deal with the world from the natural world. They learn from the animals, and one thing animals do is they watch. They, and then they decide. I let myself be seen, and I let myself be watched. And if I'm asked to step forward, I'll step forward. If I step too far, I expect to be slapped down. And many times in those books you'll find me being slapped down. But I've been humble in the face of their knowledge. I like to hang out with them. You break bread with people and life is, gets a whole lot more intimate. I've sat at their tables. I would stay with them longer than necessary. I would go to funerals, wonder where I wasn't expected to be. And gradually, you know, kind of like a bad cat that keeps coming back, I finally just got accepted. And now with my works, they see that I'm not one of these white guys that, as I say, is trafficking in Indian themes for fun and profit. I'm trying to bring their stories to the fore. And so I think I've been respected and accepted for that. What is it that you think we need to learn from the Native peoples? They have a spirituality born of this land. And that's, it's easy to say, but when you, we make our gods and our understanding, our contact with the ineffable, through our contact with the monumental forces around us, whether it be the land, the weather, they, in their own ways in each tribe, have built their relationship to the Creator through the land that they walk on. We're now walking on that land. We need to see how it was that they have addressed the crea creation around them, how they learn from it. They let nature be their teacher. They don't use it. It's not the city on a hill that where they change things for the glory of God. They instead say, what can I learn from watching how an oak stands during a storm? We all know the stories of how they will pray over an animal after they kill it so that they honor the spirit of, of what they've taken, knowing that they had to take life in order to live. Um, but they, it goes deeper than that. They'll they listen, they look at the ways different animals have taught and le lessons that they can learn from them. For example, uh, the Ojibwe in northern Minnesota where I lived have a clan system and the people in the Crane clan are the ones who are raised up to be the speakers. And the reason they are the speakers is because the Crane never says anything. But when it speaks, everyone listens because it's been so quiet. And this is the kind of teaching they get from people. Oh, you should learn from the crane, you should learn from the wolf, because the wolf always stops on the top of a hill and looks twice. Learn from it before it leaves. So learn from the wolf. That this idea that there is teaching in all of nature, and then the one fundamental thing is that just because we're able to stand outside ourselves and objectify about ourselves does not mean that we're the highest part of nature. We are just part of nature. And it's an, e it's an easy trope to say, you know, we, we're part of nature, but we tend to talk about nature as being separate from us. For them, they are part of nature. They're, they're not at the top of nature. So, just in general, people who believe that there's spirit in every rock, every tree, every cloud, every encounter, and live with a sense of the unseen as being dominant over the actual, 
have something to offer us all. It teaches us a different level of mindfulness, and I've found it to be very helpful in my own life, and I hope my work's passing on a little bit.